ஷயத்தான அஸ்லாச்சோசலாமுலாஷ்ரஃபிலம்பியாஹிரீன்மாசூமீன் அல்லதீனாஹோஹ ஹீரோம் <Sessizuk> வரமத்துவரக்கூ as announced last of the three majalis tonight and in the past two nights we talked about the wafat and the biography of our prophet as well as our second imam inshallah tonight's majlis we will be discussing in regards to our eighth imam imam ali ibn musa radha alayhi salatu wassalam allahumma salli ala the verse that i have recited or the verses that i have recited are from chapter number 89 surah fajr last four verses from number 27 to 30 in which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing this nafs which is referred to as a serene or satisfied soul when addresses by saying ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutmainna O oh, the serene or the satisfied soul irji ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiya return to your lord in the state that you are pleased with him and he is well pleased with you be among my servants and enter into my paradise these sets of four ayat if you look at it the pattern in quran that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it seems like that this is one verse because from the beginning till the end there's one constant message which is being addressed in regards to this soul which is serene which is being referred to by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to return allah is inviting it to be among its you know ibad and then to enter into its paradise But if you look at it there are four different ayat of Quran divided into four different verses and this is where we look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the Quran has divided the ayat and divided the verses into you know different parts and the surah fatiha that we recite seven verses in it are divided into these seven ayat seems like there's one message that is being addressed then why divide them into seven different verses kind of like if you look at it you know brother every year, every day announces the program if he was to announce in one sequence without breaking it the tomorrow or a week from now on january you know whatever at 8 o'clock there will be majlis commemorating the shahadat of this imam and you know tabarruk will be at this time majlis will be at this time and without any delays if he went along speaking after his announcement everybody will go up to him and say what time was the majlis 
when is it going to be who is the speaker and you know all of these things will be asked right away so that is the reason he stops and he pauses when he announces the way when a speaker starts speaking you know initially every speaker when they start giving lectures they start very slowly that doesn't mean that they do not have the art of speaking because towards the middle and the end of their speech they're going very fluently that means Initially, they're going slowly with pauses because there's a purpose behind it. The purpose is that every single thing is transferred and every single thing is understood. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us as well in this Quran. That when there are pauses after each verse, and it is also mustahab to recite in Quran, uh, in uh, namaz as well, to pause after every ayah. Because there are pauses after every ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to ponder over each and every single verse thoroughly without going to the next verse, without before going to the second verse. That is the same exact thing which is being discussed over here. That when he says, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna, getting your attention that it is nafs mutma'in which is being addressed over here. Then you go and look at it, what kind of relationship does this nafs have? Is it a one-way relationship or is it a two-way relationship which is being discussed? No, it's a two-way relationship. It says, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan and then mardiyya as well. Ponder over this aspect of it that it's a two-way relationship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. Another concept in this or another point worth mentioning in this uh, second ayat of it, is that Allah says irji'i, that means return. You usually ask for that which to return is that which was already over here, then had gone over there. So your Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually asking you to come back to where you were before. That also tells us where our mabda, where our origination is. A lot of people, a lot of mufassireen, when they talk about these verses of Surah Fajr, they mention there's a tafsir of ayat and there's tatbiq of ayat. The um, you know, impl implication of the ayah that obviously sometimes the tafsir is related to when the ayat was revealed in regards to the sha'n and nuzul of whatever event that took place. Tatbiq is maybe in accordance with the events that might take place later on. And so a lot of time this ayat is also mutabiqat, has mutabiqat with the wujud of Imam Hussain alayhi salatu was salam. But the third verse is talking about Radi and Mardi. And that is among the attributes of our eighth Imam. That he's known as Rada. And we see that every Imam possesses a particular title. Again, I'm sure you've heard this many times. Not that does not mean that the other Imams do not possess those titles. It's just that this is why this is how Allah, the Prophet had given them their names and had given them these titles when he was talking about that hadith which talks about that there will be 12 and they will all be from Quraysh, they will all be from this and he's giving them their you know features and talking about their attributes, he names them all and the feature that he mentions about our eighth Imam is that he will be Rada, Radi bil Qadr wal Qada, that his title is that he's Rada, that he's satisfied or he's content with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's radi with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes for him. And that is the case with every imam. Every imam is radi. Every imam is content. Every imam is satisfied. But we see this attribute to come in play more in the life of our eighth imam. Little bit I wanted to talk about this ayat and usually the way I go about is to explain the ayat thoroughly so that Ayat has some sort of correlation with the topic that we are discussing. It's not just an ayat that we have talked about, has no relationship with the topic that we are talking about. But inshallah, in the few minutes that I have, I want to shed some light on the life of our eighth Imam as well before a lot of severe salawat, please. <laughs> the first ayat is talking about this nafs. And I'll translate it once and then we'll use the word, the Arabic. Um, you know, word for it, which Allah has mentioned. Nafs mutma'in means the serene or the satisfied soul. What is this nafs mutma'in? Whenever the ayat of Quran are addressing something, does that mean we should just read these ayat and not try to develop those things into ourselves? No. They're for us, and therefore it is us we need to adopt and to go ahead and comply with these ayat. 
When it says nafs mutma'in, we need to study that do we possess this nafs mutma'in or not. If we possess this nafs mutma'in, then it's a good thing. If we don't, then we need to work towards possessing this nafs mutma'in. How do you possess this nafs mutma'in? The, the nafs which is satisfied. I'm sure you've heard a great deal about nafs, the jism, the ruh, and their relationship with one another. So there's not a discussion that will go into the different halat of nafs. I'm sure you've heard that in great deal as well, that there's nafs mutma'inna, lawama, ammara, mulhama, and so on and so forth. But... This nafs mutmain, do we possess that or not? Do we have this nafs or not? Is it satisfied or not? Is it radi with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? This is the question that we need to address as well. Therefore, we look at, do we possess this nafs mutmain? What are the things that satisfy you? Usually when you come and ask this question from human beings, they go ahead and list a lot of materialistic things. Maybe some people are satisfied with a lot of money. Some people are satisfied with, uh, you know, a house. Some people are satisfied with spouses. Some people are satisfied with their children. Some people are satisfied with their parents. Different things that is that are satisfying you. For example, a father will be much satisfied if his child, you know, earns education or you know gets to a maqam or a place and a status and attains a degree where he's successful. That will be a matter of satisfaction for any father. Any father sitting over here would be hoping that the child grows up learning something, understanding, educating himself or herself, and then growing and then becoming something. That is a matter of satisfaction. Maybe years down the road, if you were asked, are you satisfied with your children? You will say, yes, alhamdulillah, I'm satisfied with what they have done. So a lot of time we're looking at these materialistic satisfaction. There's nothing wrong with those materialistic satisfactions. But these satisfactions, because they're materialistic, and because this nilam, this uh, system is also Mm, uh, you know, uh, temporary and anything that is material is also temporary. So they will go away not too long. They will be gone and they will vanish. And therefore you will go back to the state which you were there earlier. So this nafs goes back to being unsatisfied once again. What is it that you find that your nafs is always satisfied? It is not temporarily given this satisfaction. Again, we look at different verses of Quran. In the Quran, as the revised says that some of the ayat go ahead and do the tafsir of the other ayat. So we look at other ayat of Quran, which leads us to believe as to how do we attain this itminan qalb, the satisfaction of the heart or the satisfaction of the nafs. Another ayat of Quran says, Allah bi dhikrillahi that ma'innul qulub. So itminan is being referred to over here, O nafs mutmain, come back to me. We look at this ayah which says, with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, itminan of this nafs is attained. So this is a clue for us. Right away, if you want to know how to attain a permanent satisfaction for this heart, you go ahead and refer to this ayah which says, with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the satisfaction of this heart is attained. Now we further look at, oh Allah, how do we do your dhikr? Another ayat of Quran says, aqim salata li dhikri. Establish the prayer so that you can go ahead and do my zikr for the sake of my zikr. Put these three ayat together. First is talking about ya yatuhan nafsul mutma'inna. Second ayat is saying Allah bi dhikr Allah tatma'inul qulub. Third ayat is saying aqim as salat al dhikri. All three put together will give you the formula which is there to attain the complete satisfaction which is not temporary. Rather it is permanent and it is there for you for you to go ahead and hold on to. Here we understand when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the best means to perform the dhikr of Allah is the salat. And rather the establishment of the salat. It's not, the Quran does not say anywhere, read namaz, the translation that we have developed. Nowhere does it say in Quran, read namaz. But don't go ahead and say, Mawlana said nowhere it says, don't read namaz, so we're not going to read namaz anymore. I'm sure you're beyond that, you're above that. It says, aqim as salat, or aqim as salat, or yuqimun as salat, or aqam as salat. These are the different Variations that have been used, establishment of the prayer. When our sixth Imam is reciting that ziyara of our third Imam, when he says, Ashadu annaka qad aqamta salat, is he merely telling us that third Imam used to pray? No, that is the Hasa. We already know that third Imam used to pray. He's actually saying the third Imam established the prayer. The prayer which was asir, the prayer which was captive 
Imam wasalam, with his blood gave freedom through this prayer. So establish this prayer. The establishment of the prayer is that which is being recommended from us or being asked from us. So here, a lot of discussion we had a little bit yesterday as well in regards to namaz. We mentioned a few points in regards to prayer. And so there's a great deal that you've heard in regards to prayer as well that will take me away from my topic. But just one sentence. Establishment of a masjid and then the importance of establishment, your establishment of the salat in a masjid. If we go ahead and refer to the ahadith and rivayat in this regard, we will be amazed as to how much emphasis has been laid down. We talked about briefly last night as to how, what do we do that our namaz is accepted. You know, we talked about the different struggles that people go through when they're praying. It's very difficult to stay focused in the salat. We mentioned a few, you know, tweaks as to how you go ahead and do that. Hopefully you can apply that as well. Um, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, the definition or one way of, you know, always securing that our namaz that we have performed is accepted and will be accepted in the bargah of Allah is to perform the salat in jama'at. Because when we perform it individually, there's so many things that we need to take care of. And if they're not taken care of, the salat might not be accepted. But when you are standing in jama'at, that too in a masjid, that is a guarantee which has been given that this salat will definitely be accepted. There's a rivayat which talks about if there are two people in namaz and jama'at, all you need is two people. Jama'at is where you need five. We need two people for jama'at. Even at home, if you're doing, make sure you try and do it in jama'at. So if you're in a masjid and you're two people performing jama'at, it says there's so many rewards for it. For example, 70 times the reward. So if there are three people, there's, you know, double that. If there are four people in jama'at, quadruple that. If there are five people in jama'at, this much is the thawab. All the way up till the 10. If there are 10 people in jama'at, the rivaya says there's no way of comprehending the thawab and the reward of this jama'at. It doesn't go beyond 10. 10 is the maximum that this rivayat mentions. That if there are 10 people in this jama'at, there's no way of comprehending as to what the reward will be. If all the angels that Allah has created are to go ahead and write down the thawab of this, ayat, this jama'at, they will not be able to go ahead and collectively write it down. Why? Why stop at 10? What is so important of this 10? You know, there are different numbers that are used in our Islamic culture and Islamic history that are some are very important for us to focus on. The reason the 10, so to, we can understand this 10. Imagine if a person only had one finger. What is it that this person can do with this one finger? Very little. Maybe push something which is very, you know, weak. Two fingers, maybe a little bit more force. Three fingers, if a person with a thumb, you can probably hold on to a pen. Without that, you can't even hold on to a pen. Four fingers, maybe you can grab something. Five, maybe you can push something which is heavy. Imagine if you had all ten. There's no limitation to what you cannot do when you have all ten fingers. No one in the history has ever claimed, Oh God, I wish I had more than ten fingers so I could have done so and so thing. No one has ever come back and said, I would have gotten that job only if I had more than ten fingers. No. Ten is the maximum that Allah has given and He has designed for you. Therefore, there's no possibility as to what you can or cannot do with what Allah SWT has given to you. Give that and take that and apply that onto the Salat as well. That when it gets to ten people in namaz e jamaat there's no way of comprehending the thawab of this namaz e jamaat Muhammad wa So this is how we attain this nafs, which is mutmain. And also to be satisfied. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran talks about وَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْتِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى That indeed, O oh Prophet, I will give you something which will satisfy you. Here we understand that all of us every single day are doing ibadah to satisfy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there are certain individuals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to satisfy. Our Imam is among those whose title is Rida. That he is Radi with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Among the things that are associated with our Imam is that he is referred to also as imam e -Zamin. And I'm sure everybody in our culture has grown up with imam e -Zamin. Although we say it, imam e zamin it's a different you know, way of saying it. But it's Zamin with a Zad. 
Imam al zamin is referred to or our eighth Imam. And the reason is that when Imam made that legendary journey towards Marwa, and Imam when he entered Marwa, Mamun with all the you know cunningness that he had invited Imam, he went ahead and got these coins minted with the name of Imam Rada. And therefore people used to carry these coins with them so that they have the name of Imam. So they're easily able to carry the name of Imam without being pointed out that if they're Shia or not. And that way they will be able to secure their journeys. Because the name of Imam was minted on these coins. From this, we have the tradition that whenever we travel, our mothers and our uh, elderly are always giving the zamanat of Imam, especially the zamanat of our eighth Imam, by putting this money into this thing which they tie around our hands, so that whenever we're traveling, until we come back from this travel, we are safe and secure. So it comes from our eighth Imam. Another incident that happens that Imam is referred to as Zamin, is that on his way to Marv, he was passing through a jungle where there was a deer and there was a hunter who was about to hunt this deer. This is where this deer spoke to Imam, asking when he saw Imam, the deer came for the, showing the you know respect to the Imam, came towards Imam and requested Imam something. This is where Imam spoke to the hunter and said, would you spare this deer? Because she has to feed her, you know, kids. She says she'll come back after having fed the kids. This hunter, obviously, speaking to Imam, you know, said, okay, fine. He gave up. A man is requesting, a man of honor is respecting, so he gave up. He said, okay, I won't hunt. But he had this doubt that, when, how is this deer going to come back? You know, that's probably just something, as an excuse. So he was there with Imam and Imam waited until this deer came back with two little other deers alongside with it. This man by looking at the promise that this animal had kept. This is where Imam also became the zamin of the animals, not just the zamin of the people. So Sawat Muhammad Wali Muhammad. So when Imam enters into Marv or the present day where Imam is buried known as Mashhad, this is where there's a lot of debate in regards to the reasons behind coming to Tus or coming to Khorasan. Obviously, Imam did not come here with his own choice. It wasn't that Mamun was, you know, giving Imam some sort of favor by bringing him in. So there are different ways of looking at this discussion. I will go through it very quickly, keeping the time and the weather and everything else in mind. That there are different views. Some of the Mukhalifin have mentioned a few views, and some of Muafiqin have mentioned a few views. Mukhalifin, they go ahead and mention the views in this way that they say that Mamun, by bringing Imam into the, you know, the government, he wanted to show that, like, look, these Shias or their Imams, they stay away from Siyasat. And they have nothing to do with the siyasat. And he also quoted what our sixth imam actually had said, that stay away from siyasat. Our sixth imam was not saying stay away from siyasat, period. He was actually saying stay away from this corrupted siyasat. Stay away from this corrupted politics. So he was, Mukhalifin say, that Mamun by bringing imam into, you know, Marv and making him part of his government was showing that how imams of the Shias remain aloof and away from the politics. Second, they say Fadl ibn Sahl and other loyals of Imam in Khurasan, Mamun wanted to keep them from revolting and there is one of the reasons why he brought Imam al-Satawasalam in. Third, Mamun was Mu'tazali. From the Aqaidi perspective, he was Mu'tazali and they are close to the Shia Aqaid and therefore Mamun was bringing Imam because they pretty much had and shared the same Aqaid. And that is one of the reasons Mamun initiated these gatherings where he would have debates with Imam and the other uh, Adyan or other Madahib Fiqhi over there. Fourthly, they said Mamun wanted to prove that he's loyal to Ahl Bayt and that is the reason that he would go ahead and bring these other dignitaries 
to go ahead and debate with Imam, knowing that Imam will always come out successful. So he wanted to elevate the status of Al Bayd and to make people understand the high status of Al Bayd. That was actually the contrary of what he wanted to achieve, which we inshallah will discuss. And lastly, Mamun gave one of his daughters to Imam al Rada and second of his daughters to Imam al Jawad. That further proves his loyalty towards Al Bayd. Who, if you hate someone, if you are an enemy of someone, why would you go ahead and give your daughter into the marriage of that person? All of these are basically the claims that are made by the Mukhalifin saying, in proving how Mamun was loyal to Ahl Bayt and how he was doing all of these things to show respect towards Imam Alayhi But it was on the contrary as to the, all of these things. Mamun was actually trying to show through his debates that his initial objective was to degrade Imam. He did not think that Imam would be able to overcome these debates which he had initiated. And only later on he understood that Imam would not be succumbed to any of these debates that he was taking part into. But he wanted to achieve another thing. He said, if I get Imam involved in these debates, one thing that will happen, either Imam will come out successful. If he comes out successful, you know, then I have involved him, indulged him only into the discussions which are ilmi. And therefore people will only look at Imam and an educator, a person who is only good for education and has nothing to do with siyasat and politics. And he will stay away from that. Secondly, if he doesn't win and if he loses, therefore I've already humiliated Imam. So either way, it was a win-win situation for Mamun that by bringing Imam Rada, Either Imam wins or Imam loses. If he loses, he has humiliated Imam. If Imam wins, he has also achieved the second objective, which is to keep Imam Raza occupied with these people and with these gatherings so he cannot do anything or interfere in the affairs of the government. Salatih Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We see that in the real reasons, actually, Mamun was coerced to bring Imam into. Uh, Khurasan. The reason is because of the distances at that time. It wasn't the same time as this time that we're living in. It's not a global world at that time. Because of these distances and Imam being in Hijaz, he had a fear that his government could be toppled any day. And so by bringing Imam close to himself, he wanted to keep a close eye on Imam wasalam. Second, you know, by having Imam close by all of those people who were in the surrounding, they will also think that Imam is now involved with the government. So therefore, it is legitimizing the activities of Mamun al-Rashid. So whatever he does, Imam is alongside with him. The Shias will never go ahead and object to what Mamun is doing and nor they will go ahead and object to the activities that he's taking out. Although those things were the ones that Imam right away when he came in, he said, I don't want to have anything to do with what you do under my name or what you go ahead and do as far as your government is concerned. Thirdly, he wanted to cover up for the Shahadat of our seventh Imam by showing that, look, you know, we have nothing to do with the Shahadat of seventh Imam. If we were the one perpetrators of killing seventh Imam, why would I invite him and give his son the crown, make him to be the crown prince and go ahead and give him this what I have in issue. Why would we do this if we were the perpetrators or the killers of the seventh Imam? So he was trying to cover up for what his father had done, Harun al-Rashid, by killing our seventh Imam. These were some of the reasons and the real reasons that our ulama and our uh, scholars have mentioned as far as Mamun's objectives and motives were concerned. Here, towards the end, I wanted to very briefly focus on some of the aspects as to how Imam wasalam, when he gives message, our eighth Imam, when he gives message, how he's communicating with the public or how he's communicating with people even living today. This is not the case that Imam, because he lived so many years ago, he did not communicate with us. In fact, Shah Abdul Azim Hassani is actually among, you know, a very well-known companions of our eighth and lived in the time of our eighth and ninth Imam. He narrates a hadith from our eighth Imam, which is actually carrying a message for the Shias to come later on. Imam Alayhi Wasallam says to Abdul Azim Hassani, he says, Ya Abdul Azim Hassan. He says, Ya Abdul Azim. أبلغ عني أولياء السلام وعبد العظيم convey my salam to my أولياء 
to my friends, to my lovers. Imagine we are being conveyed salam of our eighth imam. Imagine imam of your time, imam of zamana sends salutations onto you. How would you feel at that time? We feel great if any of the personalities who are famous in the world today, they convey their salams to us. We right away feel, you know, uh, as if we are something very important because an important personality has sent salam onto us. This is imam of your time or imam at that time is sending this salam. He said, Ya Abdul Azim, Ablig Anni Awliya'i as salam. Convey my salam to my people. Second thing that he says, he says, Qullahum. This is the message that Imam is giving to them. Qullahum. La yaj'alu lishshaytani ala anfusihim sabila. Do not let shaitan penetrate into your hearts, into your nufus. The discussion had begun with the nafs as well initially. We were talking about nafs mutma'inna and how to remain or keep this nafs to be mutma'in and satisfied. The discussion has come back to this nafs mutma'in as well, where Imam is saying, do not let shaitan penetrate into your hearts. And this is where I guess the message goes on to the kids especially. To this penetration could occur by a friend. This penetration could occur by a place. This penetration could occur by what we see. This penetration could occur by what we hear. This penetration could occur by what we read. And this is where it is very, very important for us to filter what we read, what we see, what we hear, and whom do we hang out around with or the places that we walk into. All of these could be the means of the penetration of shaitan into the nufus. But once the shaitan penetrates into the nufus, then obviously there's no way of coming out of it. Indeed, it is very difficult for us to come out of it. This is where we also read in uh, one of our famous books, Usul al-Kafi, where the hadith or the rawaya says, you know, this uh, nafs to remain away from aloof from shaitan or to not be penetrated by shaitan. Because if shaitan has penetrated, a lot of time what happens, these Ahkam or these sayings or the words of Quran will not have effect on us. These words do have effects, but they will not have effects if there's something haram that has penetrated into us. And that is the reason we see Sayyid al-Shuhada on in the day of Ashur. What is he saying to these enemies that are standing in front of him? He says, what has happened to you? Why don't you listen to me? Why don't you pay attention to what I'm saying? The Imam himself says, Qad mulia'at butunukum. In al haram. Indeed, your butun, your bellies are filled with haram, and that is the reason there's no effect of my saying onto you. Otherwise, is it possible that Imam would say something and people will not have any effect? No, it is impossible. Sometimes some very energetic or you know speakers come and they say something, and right away it affects you. Right away you take this ta'sir, let alone when an Imam comes and says something to you, that will definitely have effect. But Imam is saying, Why won't there be any effect on you? Nah, the reason is haram because your bellies are filled with haram, and that is the reason there's no effect on you. So a lot of time what we feed our kids, a lot of time where we have attained this food, how halal or haram this food is, that is also going to be effective. Usul Kafi, the Rabbi says, you know, Lukumatul Haram, you mean of One morsel which is haram, it will affect not just in you, but also for the zurriyat, the progenies to come. That is how difficult it is, and that is how effective that would be. So Imam is saying the second message that he gives after having conveyed the salam, he said, Do not let shaitan penetrate into your nufus keep shaitan away from penetrating into your nufus third thing that imam says murhum fil hadith that he talks about in regards to the people that pass by the people and speak to them with truth dealing with the people make sure that you're always righteous even if this righteousness is sour is not sweet make sure you take the path of righteousness Allah has, uh, ahadith have mentioned this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not kept anything, any shifa in that which is haram. A lot of times we go after the things, you know, there's shifa in it. This is, this is a cure. There's medicines which might be haram, for example, or might have substances which is beyond the quantity, which is not allowed for us. And therefore we go ahead and consume those things. No, 
La ja'ala Allah fi haram is shifa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not put any shifa in anything that is haram. So if anything is haram, you will not find cure in that. That might just be a you know, gimmick by some companies trying to sell their products. But let alone we stay aloof from them. And there are plenty of examples in this regard. When you speak to people, make sure that there's righteousness. Do not deviate. Do not deceive people. That is one of the messages that our Imam al-Rada is given to us after having conveyed the salam. First message is do not let shaitan penetrate. That is one message for the kids. Second, maybe for the adults. When you treat and speak with the people, make sure when you deal with the people, it is done on the basis and the concept of righteousness. If a lot of time you don't know something, don't try to make it up. You know, we've seen this a lot of time that you someone asks you a question. For example, if I have this turban on my head, in fact, there's a joke in this regards as well. Um, Mullah Nasruddin, you know, obviously if he's a fiction or non-fiction character, we don't know. But nonetheless, there's a, you know, it's attached with him that someone asked him a question. And he replied away right away. He said, I don't know. The person looked at him and said, you have such a huge amama and turban on your head and you don't know? He took off the amama and he put it on that person's head. He said, if this amama can give you knowledge, then you go ahead and answer. This amama is not going to give you knowledge. Yes, this amama is on my head. This turban is on my head. But that doesn't mean I possess all the ulum and all the sciences. So, if someone asks you a question and you don't know, it is a bigger thing to go ahead and say, La adri, I do not know. Then to go ahead and make up something or speculate about something. Who's saying La adri? Prophet is saying La adri. Ayat of Quran talks about a surah jinn. Verse number 25 says, in adri ma am When Prophet was asked in regards to the adab, Prophet replied by saying, or my Prophet was told, Muhammad say to them, I do not know whether that which Allah has threatened you by, is it close by or is it be delayed? Prophet is saying, I do not know. Prophet, the one who's Habib ilahi, the one who's been bestowed all the ulum by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the one who's saying, La adri, or I do not know. Then why should we fear, or why should we feel ashamed if we don't know something? Imam is saying, Murhum bis sidq. Make sure that you always speak sidq and righteousness with them. If you don't know something, excuse, that is a bigger thing. And lastly, Imam says, Wa ada il amana. Make sure when you are dealing with your fellow brothers, make sure that you, the trust that they have put in you, you go ahead and pay back those trusts. This is again coming right directly out of an ayat of Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah ya'muru, ya'murukum an tu'addul amanati ila ahliha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses you, he orders you, he commands you to give the trust which has been given to you back to those who have entrusted you with it. So go back and give these trust back to those people. We see the three messages that Imam is giving. First, he's saying, do not let shaitan penetrate. Second, the Imam is saying, murhum bisith, make sure that you treat them with righteousness. And third thing Imam is saying that make sure you give back the amanat that you were trusted with. Lastly, Imam alayhi salatu wa salam, ek aur cheez humare liye chhod ke ja rahe hain ki agar shiyon ko parakhna hai aur agar shiyon ke darmiyan tumhe ye dekhna hai ki kaun aur agar kisi jagah pe imtihan lena chahte ho shiyon ka to Imam ne usme bhi teen cheezon ke bare mein kaha. Waqt nahi hai ki uski detail mein main jaun sirf list bayan karke Rabt Masaib aur aapki zehmat tamam. Imam ne kaha agar shiyon ko dekhna chahte ho kyunki bahut se log the jo Imam ke paas aaye aur Madina se safar karke aaye Imam se milne ke liye. Lekin Imam ne unko baziyabi ki ijazat na di, milne ki ijazat na di. Kafi der tak, kafi dino tak Imam se milne aane ki koshish karte rahe. Imagine aap Imam ki bargah mein jana cha rahe ho aur Imam aapko mustarad kar raha ho. Mustarad hote rahe. बार बार जब ये देखा मायूस होके जा रहे थे तो आखिरी दफा आए के आके खटखटाए इमाम के दर पे जब आए इमाम ने बाजियाबी की इजाजत दी आते हैं मिलते हैं इमाम से तो फौरन ये शिकायत की मौला हम तो आपके शिया हैं आपने हमको मिलने से रोक दिया हम इतनी दूर से आपसे मिलने आए हैं इमाम ने कहा कि ला अरा फी वजूहकुम सीमाहु शिया मुझे क्यों तुम्हारे चेहरों पे वो शियात नजर नहीं आती जो कि शियों में होनी चाहिए اپنے آپ کو شیعہ مت کرو تم صرف اور صرف ہمارے محب ہو ہماری محبت ہے تمہارے دلوں میں لیکن اپنے آپ کو تم شیعہ نہ کہو شیعہ جانتے ہو کون ہیں سلمان شیعہ تھے 
ابو ذر شیعہ تھے امار شیعہ تھے وہ شیعہ تھے اگر تم ان جیسے ہو تو ہاں یقیناً تمہیں حق ہے کہ تم اپنے آپ کو شیعہ کہہ سکتے ہو اس طریقے سے امام نے کہا کہ اگر امتحان لینا چاہتے ہو شیعوں کا کہ کون واقع شیعہ ہے تو کہا تین چیزوں میں امتحان لے سکتے ہو کہ کیا وہ اہمیت دیتے ہیں اوقات نماز کے اوپر نماز پر کافی گفتگو ہو چکی ہے وقت نہیں ہے اس میں جانے کا دوسری چیز حفظ اسرار و مسائل کیا وہ اسرار کو سیکرٹس کو ان کی حفاظت رکھ سکتے ہیں کیا ان پر ٹرسٹ کیا جا سکتا ہے اگر ان سے کوئی بات کی جائے کیا وہ محافظت کرنے کے قابل ہیں اور تیسری چیز جو امام نے کہی کہ وہ کس طریقے سے اپنے جو خدا و نمتعال نے ان کو دولت دی ہے جو خدا و نمتعال نے ان کو یہ اتنی سہولتیں دی ہیں اس چیز کو وہ شیئر کرنے میں کس حد تک ہیں کہ اپنے بھائیوں کا خیال رکھتے ہیں کہ نہیں رکھتے ہیں یا صرف اس مال و ذر کو صرف اور صرف اپنی ذات کے اوپر خرش کرتے ہیں ان تین چیزوں میں تم شیعوں کو پہچان سکتے ہو ان تین چیزوں کو دیکھنا چاہو تو دیکھ لو جو چیزیں جو لوگ یہ چیزیں رکھتے ہیں تو یقیناً وہ شیعت کے معیار کے اوپر اترتے ہیں جن لوگوں میں یہ چیز نہیں ہے تو وہ یقیناً وہ شیعت کے معیار سے گر جاتے ہیں امام علیہ السلط وسلام نے تین سال اپنی زندگی کے آخری بڑی مشکل میں گزارے سن دو سو میں امام خراسان میں داخل ہوتے ہیں اور دو سو تین میں امام کی شہادت واقع ہوتی ہے یہ سلاطین زمانہ کا ایک ٹرینڈ رہا ہے کہ جب انہوں نے کوشش کی ہے اماموں کو سپریس کرنے کی اماموں کے اوپر مشکلات کو لانے کی تاکہ وہ اپنی حکومت کو چلا سکیں اور کسی طریقے سے اس کو ادامہ دے سکیں لیکن جب آخر میں آ کے مجبور ہو جاتے ہیں تو وہی بزدلانہ طریقہ اپناتے ہیں کہ جو آج دنیا میں اور نظر آتا ہے کس طریقے سے شیعوں کو قتل کیا جا رہا ہے وہی بزدلانہ طریقہ انہوں نے بھی اپنایا اور وہ کیا طریقہ تھا کہ اگر امام کو اپنے شکنجے میں نہ لے سکے تو امام کو صفح ہستی سے مٹا دیا جائے امام کو زہر دے دیا جائے یا دوسرے طریقوں سے امام کو اس دنیا سے رخصت کر دیا جائے بس یہی وہ طریقہ تھا کہ جو معمون کو نظر آ رہا تھا ان تمام شکنجوں کے باعث وہ نہیں کر سکا امام کو اپنے کنٹرول میں اور نہ ہی کر پاتا اسی لیے اس نے ایک شب جب امام علیہ السلط والسلام ابا سلط حروی کے ساتھ بیٹھے تھے کہا دیکھو اے ابا سلط کل مجھے یہ فاجر بلائے گا اور جب میں اس کے پاس جاؤں گا اور اگر میں واپس آؤں تم دیکھو میری ابا میرے سر کے اوپر ہے تو تم مجھ سے گفتگو نہ کرنا یہ فاجر کل مجھ کو مسموم کر دے گا امام صبح کی نماز کے بعد سے بیٹھے ہوتے ہیں کہ مامون کا غلام آتا ہے امام کو بلاتا ہے امام جاتے ہیں مامون کے پاس امام بیٹھتے ہیں وہاں پہ مامون کھڑا ہوتا ہے امام کی تعظیم کے لیے امام کو بٹھاتا ہے اس کے بعد سے امام سے کہتا ہے کہ یہ میوہ ہے یہ کچھ انگور ہیں یہ بہترین انگور ہیں امام نے کہا بہشت کے انگور اس سے بھی بہتر ہیں کہا کچھ نوش فرمائیے امام نے کہا نہیں مجھے میل نہیں ہے مجھے کھانے کا شوق نہیں ہے میں مجھے واف رکھو اس سے امام نے ہر ممکن کوشش کی جہاں تک امام ان انگوروں سے اپنے آپ کو بچا سکتے جانتے تھے کہ یہ مسموم ہیں لیکن اس نے ایک بات کہی کہ آپ ہم پہ تحمت لگانا چاہ رہے ہیں کہ ہم اس ذریعے سے آپ کو قتل کر دیں گے بس امام نے اس حالت میں کچھ انگور لیے اور امام نے کچھ انگور نوش فرمائے بس دو تین انگور امام نے نوش فرمائے تھے کہ اثر امام کے جسم ظاہر ہونے لگا امام فوراً کھڑے ہو جاتے ہیں مامون کہتا ہے کہ کہاں جا رہے ہیں کہا وہیں جہاں تو بھیجنا چاہتا تھا امام نکل کے آتے ہیں ابا اپنی سر پہ رکھ لی ہے ابا سل کو پہلے سے حکم تھا امام حجرے میں چلے جاتے ہیں وہ آخری اوقات امام نے کس مشکل میں گزارے ان کس ڈیفیکلٹی میں امام نے وہ اوقات گزارے کہ اس وقت جب امام کے فرزند با اعجاز آتے ہیں ہمارے راپ کے نوے امام امام حشتم کے پاس پہنچتے ہیں اب اصلت حیران ہے کہ یہ بچہ کس طریقے سے داخل ہو گیا دروازے سے آتے نہ دیکھا کہا بیٹا آپ کیسے آ گئے کہا وہ جس نے مجھ کو مدینے سے یہاں بھیجا اسی نے مجھ کو اس گھر کے اندر بھی داخل کر دیا کہا آپ کون ہیں کہا میں تمہارا امام ہوں میں حجت خدا ہوں تمہارے اوپر امام رضا کے بعد سے اس کے بعد سے باپ اور بیٹے میں گفتگو ہوتی ہے یقیناً اسرار امامات امام رضا امام جواد کو دیتے ہیں اس کے بعد سے امام کی شہادت واقع ہوتی ہے اب آسل سے کہا امام نے کہ جاؤ 
تجہیز و تفین کا سامان لے کے آؤ کہا ایسی کوئی چیز نہیں ہے گھر پہ کہا نہیں میں کہہ رہا ہوں موجود ہے جاتے ہیں اب آساد وہ چیزیں لے کے آتے ہیں امام کی تجہیز ہوتی ہے تکفین ہوتی ہے امام کو دفنایا جاتا ہے میں کہوں گا امام رضا بڑی مصیبت میں آپ نے وقت گزارا آپ کو غریب الغربہ کہا جاتا ہے ارے غربت کی موت اور غربت کی شہادت ہوئی آپ کی واقع لیکن کم از کم آپ کے فرزان اعجاز الہی کے ذریعے آپ کے پاس پہنچ گئے ارے میرا مظلوم امام سر کربلا تیسرے امام امام سجاد موجود ہیں باپ کا لاشا بے گور و کفن پڑا ہوا ہے لیکن مجبوری یہ ہے کہ باپ کو نہ تجہیز نہ تکفین نہ نماز جنازہ پڑھ سکتے ہیں اللہ اللہ نطلال قوم الظالمین